Welcome to ESGX Live, the community for information and education to inspire collaboration and action to rebuild a more resilient and more inclusive economy and hopefully get people to vote too. With me, Nigel Lake here in New York on a cold rainy day and my co-host Paul Herman in San Francisco. I think it's much sunnier on the West Coast and welcome to Ballot Box. We'll be joined by Kurt Lieberman from Magnite Global shortly and also our own October surprise, Dr. Kristin Hull from NIA Impact Capital, who's joining us today as well. So we very much look forward to the discussion. Just very briefly, I was going to share a few, uh, few perspectives on where we are now as a quick snapshot. Many of you will be across this, some of you won't. And of course, in the US, as we prepare for this electoral race, the, the electoral map from 2016 is on the left and where we are now is on the right with 226 electoral college votes looking likely for the Democrats, 125 for the Republicans, 187 in the middle undecided and of course this is the electoral college system whereby every state has a number of electoral college votes allocated to it in almost all the states whoever wins the race for president in that state collects all those votes of course it is more complicated than this and you have to dial into dive down into the details state by state to understand what is going on so these are the most marginal states uh, going from the top, the ones that are more, more in favour of the Republicans down, uh, the, the Democrats down to the bottom, those more in favour of the Republicans, uh, and the ones where there's a number of electoral college votes listed here are the 187 that I'm talking about, and you can see that the you know how the election played out in 2016, almost all of these went for the Republicans, and the current polling from Real Clear Politics and from 538 over on the right shows most of these solidly on the Democrat side of the ticket. We'll come back to maybe to exactly what that means and where the line is in a bit more detail. But essentially, if the Republicans uh, cannot capture everything from Wisconsin down on this chart, then the Democrats will win in the upcoming election. Of course, we are in a pretty unprecedented environment. There have been endorsements from uh, publications such as Scientific American, which have never endorsed a presidential candidate before. Of course, also in the foreground, we have the appointment of a Supreme Court justice going through the process right now. And if I zoom this, uh, we might come back to this again, zoom this in a little bit further. But what this means for the US legal system and for some important pieces of legislation, irrespective of what happens in the election, is incredibly important. So with that as the introduction, I will um, invite Paul to join us and to kick things off a little and also Kurt too, uh, and Kristen if she is there. And we will dive into this. I think the idea is we will work through a whole series of, of points in here in a very much a kind of discur discursive format. And please do you know, add your questions in the Q&A. I can see that there is one already. Uh, and please do introduce yourselves to each other and any particular questions you've got or things that you're interested in in the chat, and we will do our level best to cover those too. Paul, over to you. Thanks, Nigel. Welcome, everybody, um, to the October surprise, uh, day 13. Uh, we've had an October surprise just about every day, and we still have another almost 20 days to go in October. Um, uh, delighted uh, to be joined today by Kurt Lieberman, uh, CEO of Magni Global, and joining us in just a moment or two will be Kristen Hall of NIA Impact Capital. Uh, Nigel, thanks as always for assembling a short overview. We have more visuals to get into. Um, just want to encourage everybody, as some of you have already started uh, asking questions in the question box or in the chat box. And um, uh, and the first one is going to be uh, why anybody should vote for Biden or for Trump. So we may get into that in a little bit. So hold on, we'll express some points of view, but I think we want to cover here like trends and dynamics uh, at the state and um, uh, local level potentially. Um, so um, Kurt, do you... Uh, Want to, and then we'll, Kurt, in just a few moments, we'll cover your latest uh, research on populism. Do you want to give us a preview of that? Sure. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you, uh, Nigel and Paul, for having me on the ESGX. Uh, 
these are great events, as you as they know. It's not my first time on ESGX. There's Kristen. Welcome, Kristen. Great. She's got her. There we go. So, um, in addition to talking about the um, election itself, one of the pieces of work that Magni is working on is an assessment of populism. The term's been used a lot in the last couple of years. And we're in the process of determining whether or not populism is actually helpful to the quality of governance in a country. Since this is a teaser, you have to stay on till the end, till we come back to populism to hear what the emerging perspective is. All right, it won't be at the end, but it'll be coming up shortly. <laughs> it's coming up shortly, okay. And Kristen, welcome. Thank you, hello everyone. Great to have you with us. I know you're always so very thoughtful about uh, elections and voting at all levels. Um, uh, so what's the, and uh, we just introduced everything as like the October surprise. So have we had enough surprises in October yet? Um, it depends on your stomach. I would say definitely we want to uh, buckle our seatbelts, you know, certainly we have more surprises in store. Absolutely. We have three more weeks um, to keep those seatbelts buckled. Great. Nigel, um, can you put up the uh, Supreme Court? So one of the issues, this is interesting. Uh, this is a very interesting chart that I came across. Um, so if you can't see it yet, you can in the top right, there's a gallery view. Um, and so at the very least, if you hit the gallery view, you can see this chart. Um, and so what this shows <clears throat> is, um, and uh, we'll figure out the right link to put in the, in the chat box as well. This is the tilts of Supreme Court justices over time while they've been on the Supreme Court. Uh, higher up is conservative. You can see in the top right, Clarence Thomas is that blue line up in the top right. Started conservatives, got a little more conservative, has pretty much been conservative. In the bottom right is Justice Sotomayor. So you can see she started uh, liberal and has gotten more liberal over time. The fascinating part of this chart is it seems certainly in more recent times that all, almost all justices have gotten more liberal uh, as they make decisions on the court. And um, I got into a debate about this saying, well, it doesn't, isn't the role of a Supreme Court justice to um, do the maximum good for the maximum amount of people. Um, and of course, there can be a debate around that as to whether you're um, adapting to the times or thinking back to what was envisioned back in the 1700s. So what do you think, uh, Kristen and Kurt? Do you think being on the Supreme Court and therefore that choice, it matters less about who you appoint at the time and more of how they evolve? What's, what are important characteristics of this and uh, what we should um, absorb from these Supreme Court hearings and will they affect the election? <laughs> That's a lot of questions. Yeah, all right, go for it. <laughs> let, let, me, let me try something that, Paul, that you and I were talking about. I think the group would find interesting. This takes and collapses a whole pile of issues onto a single liberal versus conservative spectrum. And uh, the reality is the issues fall into various different domains. A simple example would be there are more economic, financial, fiscal issues, and there are more social issues. You take a look at Kennedy, and I've forgotten what color. Kennedy is that limeish green color. I don't see Kennedy as having changed a lot over his tenure. So, so to a certain extent, this bouncing around probably reflects a different mix of issues over time because he tended to be more libertarian, fiscally conservative, socially liberal. And it's tough to represent that on a single, single axis. Got it. All right, Kristen, what do you think? Uh, do people evolve when they're on the Supreme Court? And does it matter who gets appointed? Well, it absolutely matters who gets appointed, absolutely. Um, as human beings, I'm really hopeful that we are all evolving. Um, and yet those people that are nominated um, to the Supreme Court are nominated because of their past. 
They're really not nominated for a forward looking view, which is what we want to have for all of our companies and our economy. And yet that's not what we're looking for on the Supreme Court. And so could we hope that they're, I guess we're, those that have nominated them are going to hold them accountable to their past and to those same decisions. And so it's really tricky to be on the Supreme Court um, if you are going to evolve past um, your own constituents. So it's tricky, right? Um, and that's why it's such a compact, compressed thing that we may or may not happen in the next couple of weeks um, is if we have a nomination that actually goes through, given that um, you know, the ballot boxes are already full and not counted yet about who we want to actually be making that decision. I'll point out one more thing on this chart and Nigel, feel free to add on to it. The black line on the chart, which is mostly in the conservative upper half portion, you can see Warren Berger, uh, Rehnquist first starting as a conservative justice and as chief justice trending down according to this scale, subject to the uh, uh, interpretation like Kurt alluded to. And then Roberts sort of picking up where Rehnquist let off and then um, moving towards the middle. So. Is, this will be fascinating, and especially the election issue that comes up is not only the rush to nominate now versus the non-rush to have a Senate, um, a Republican-controlled Senate approve Obama appointee versus a Republican-controlled Senate approve a Trump appointee. Um, the question is, will there be more lines on this chart uh, in a new administration, either one, <laughs> uh, Biden or Trump? Would the Supreme Court get expanded or compressed in some way? Um, any thoughts on that, Kristen, uh, Kurt, or Nigel? Well, I'm happy to jump in. And so it's so interesting because what are we talking about um, a stacked court? You know, it came up in the debates. And if we were to add another conservative at this time, would that already make it stacked? You know, whereas I think the question that the nominee, the vice president current was asking was, are you going to stack it? And I think the that the um, Kamala Harris was trying to, without saying it, say, actually it's already stacked and we're just gonna try to even it out and find some balance. And so are either of those the right thing to do? I think those are the questions of our time for sure. If I could uh, riff off on a tangential point, but I think it'll be interesting for the group. Um, someone who I know knows Roberts, not well, but knows him and said that he was an interesting choice as chief justice when you had four conservative and four liberal justices because he was trying to avoid five, four decisions and he was searching for six, three or higher to create something clear. When it was something where he tended to disagree but saw a five, four against him, he was gonna be part of, the five, part of the four, not part of the five, he would tend to switch his vote to be with the majority so that it was 6-3, but then he would, as Chief Justice, have the prerogative to write the formal opinion and he would work to narrow the precedent created from that opinion. He loses that power in this, the way we're headed. If it's a 6-3 or 5-3 plus Roberts court, it's gonna to be tough for him to play that role, whether you like that role or not. It's just tough, he, he'll have to change his approach to the court. If Nigel, could, are you seeing trends worldwide? Because you keep tabs on the Australia Supreme Court. Uh, yeah. What do you um, see? Generally, it's the case. That the most interesting one actually is not the US Supreme Court, it's the Polish Supreme Court, which has been in the middle of a uh, stacking deal. Their, their appellate system and their Supreme Court work di differently than our appellate and Supreme Court. But effectively, uh, the right-wing populist leader of Poland's been stacking his court for a period of time, and that's caused problems with the EU, and the EU has proven relatively ineffective. In a, they say a lot of things, but it's tough the way the EU is structured to really intervene in that. Hmm. Um, I mean, the, the thing that, that strikes me is that you know, all of this, of course, has become incredibly polarized because there is a system which can be exploited if you, if the timing works for you or depending on how you're prepared to behave in government, where you can put in a whole series of young people who may be there for a relatively long period of time. And is that really how a legal system should be driven? It makes you feel or makes me feel as someone who's not a student of this part of the American system of governance. 
that there ought to be some mechanism to provide more steady rotation and more independence for the the, the legal system than you seem to have, or than, than the way this seems to work. Incredibly yeah. complicated. I, I agree with you. I think there's some interesting political fallout. Uh, Trump barely won in 16. So anytime you say, why did Trump win? If when it's a close election of, of anybody, any factor can be the pivotal factor. One possible pivotal factor was McConnell not holding the um, whole process for, uh, for, um, his, for Obama's appointee and pushing that into the new term, rallying Republicans, many of whom found Trump distaste, distasteful, to vote for him so that Trump could then replace that position. So if anything, what McConnell did probably helped Republicans, I would submit, back in 60. I would submit there's already evidence that it's playing the other way, which is take a look at the fundraising, particularly since Barrett's been nominated. There's record fundraising, not only for Biden, but also for senatorial candidates. Uh, the uh, person taking on um, Graham, what's his name? Uh, Jamie Harrison? Jamie Harrison in South Carolina. Yeah. And what, what did he raise last month? 57 amounts. Last quarter, yeah. Yeah, Merrick, Merrick Garland was Obama's appointee. Thank you, Nick. We get we get crib notes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, that, that that's probably a neat segue to the Senate pool. Well, let's do one thing before the Senate because the question came up about um, uh, legislative versus executive versus judicial. Um, Nigel, do you want to jump to the slide that has who controls all the House, Senate, and President, and then we'll come back to the um, yeah Senate races. So. Now, do you want to explain this chart? There's red. Yeah, and so so this goes back to after the Second World War, showing of the three parts of government here, I the 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 president, the Senate, and the House. How many of those are under Democrat Democrat control? Obviously, the blue line or Republican control, the red line. And there's a period here from fifty five to ninety five, where the Republicans did not at any point have control of all three of those parts of government. I'm not saying branches, because that's a whole different discussion. And of course, that has changed in the last 20 years. There has been a somewhat more even split of power, perhaps. But also, we have seen significant swings from a period where the Republicans had control of the you know, the White House and the Senate and the House for a period of time. And then so did the Democrats briefly in Obama's first term. And then it swung back the other way with Trump uh, at the beginning of his term. And of course, edged back the other way in the 2018 midterms with the, the House coming back under Democrat control. And off to the right of this chart, it's almost certain that the blue line will step up one position uh, here in the, well, it looks very likely but will the Democrats get to complete control is another whole question. So Kristen, um, you've lived through many of these elections. Uh, you lived through many of these changes, sort of House midterm changes, and you've also brought up the point about corporate donations. So how are corporate donations versus individual donations helping shift these dynamics? Well, one, I hope you're not making a comment on my age because... <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I do pay attention to these election cycles and corporate donations are huge. And so, of course, in this last presidency, the, our current presidency, corporations have had much more cash because of tax credits and all different incentives that. So what are they doing with that money has been interesting to watch. And that's definitely something we're thinking of. And so. Um, you know, are they doing shareholder buybacks, which is one way that can actually uh, artificially inflate or deflate the economy and their own share price. There's all sorts of ethical issues about that. Um, also, what are they doing with that cash flow as far as corporate donations? Um, and that is something. So I added on into the chat um, Open Secrets, which is one interesting website where you can actually look up whether it's going to the blue or the, the red as far as uh, different donations. And you can kind of track both on the C4, which is for actual candidates and PACs, um, and then for the C3, which are um, organizations working on behalf of either party. And so um, 
I think it's really important for all investors to know and at least to have their advisors know, is this a green portfolio? We want to know that, right? Are they fossil fuel free? Is it a red portfolio or a blue portfolio? You really can look at where these donations are going and where your investment dollars, because of course, I think everyone on this call is encouraging everyone to vote at the ballots or if not before, vote often and early. Um, we also want to encourage people- And in the right box. <laughs> and in the right box, and in the right box. Um, well, actually in the right box, right? Because I think that's coming yeah. up in California that there's some yeah. mysterious fake boxes. Is that what you're alluding to? Yeah, and the, it's worked just crazy. as a point. These, these things are, it's not a, just an American phenomenon. We had in the Australian general election a year or so ago, one of the parties creating signs designed to look like they were printed in official election commission font and colors instructing people in Chinese to vote for a particular candidate. Now, it's another version of just terribly egregious behavior. So it's, these things are happening all over the place. It's not just here. Super, Sorry, Kristen. Super egregious. Okay, well, so just yeah. one I was going to say also about where your companies that you're invested in are playing parts in these elections. They absolutely are. Um, and the larger the company, the larger the budget, really. And so you do kind of want to know, or you at least want your advisor, your portfolio manager to know and be conscious of how corporations are actually people when it comes to voting um, and these different things. One of the things we're doing at NIA is asking our corporations, all of the ones that we're invested in on a couple of things. One is that there actually was, um, Trump's made a statement that um, diversity and inclusion programs are no longer allowed and that will be implemented in November. Mm -hmm. So what are what does that mean if you had an anti-bias or if you had a women's empowerment or if you had a hiring practice? Um, how will this education going on within your corporation? So we're talking to our companies about that. We're also mm -hmm. talking to them about the Garland, or not the Garland, but the, the current nominee. Um, if Roe v. Wade is threatened at a national level, how are corporations and our U.S. companies poised to um, take care of their workers in, in a situation like this? And where will they use their voice and their, their investments in voting in that situation? Yeah, so let's dig into that a little bit because uh, I know we have lots of political material which we can uh, cover, but like for ESG or impact investing, or even the role of business versus government versus nonprofits. So some healthcare systems like Kaiser, you may know, that's a nonprofit. Many healthcare systems are not only nonprofits, some of them are religious uh, hospitals. So um, what does everybody think about that? Is there just, there's been an erosion in trust in institutions. Um, those institutions are typically government institutions. There's not as much an erosion in business. Obviously, there's wealth inequality and access to healthcare issues. So, uh, what's at stake? Who, you know, will only businesses continue to prevail, or is there some other countervailing force? Well, there's a lot of erosion of trust in businesses, especially financial services businesses, about a decade ago. And so, they may not have deteriorated further, but they haven't gone out of their way in many cases to improve their their reputation. I see this going in a cycle. The pendulum is going to swing back. I don't know what will cause it. Um, what would help would be a leader who's charismatic, who's inclusive, and who believes in institutions and good governance because he or she could draw us towards that. And to, in their own ways, Bill Clinton, despite his personal failings, did that. I think in some ways Ronald Reagan did that. Clearly FDR did that. I think Eisenhower did that in his own ways. Um, it, I don't know that Kennedy was a president long enough to understand the full implications of what he would have done. So I see that happening. I don't think it's predictable. I don't think you can say, well, look at this person, you know, Beto O'Rourke and he's gonna do it or Peter Buttigieg or pick someone on the Republican side. I think we'll be surprised and we'll look back after it's happened and said, oh, that was obvious, but ahead of time, mm. it's not gonna be obvious. Yeah, look, I think that's right. And the other thing here is th there are clearly a lot of very large financial institutions who have a significant interest in matters related to sustainability and ESG. 
it's a lot of that is coming from the underlying investors, the LPs, not necessarily the managers that are higher profile. But that drive is going in one direction and one direction only, in my view, because those organizations understand that their long term interests and long term returns for their own investors and pensioners are served by addressing these issues. So there's a level at which what happens at a presidential level or in federal politics will not influence that it will influence that trend but it will not it can't stop that trend in my view there's there is too much money lined up in a particular direction that's driven by cold hard thinking and economics Kristen, can you build a portfolio for uh the future of business and other investments maybe muni bonds uh delivering solutions that government maybe can't it's really interesting. I mean, we, we have to, there's, there's been some attempts at some of this. So there actually was, I was trying to look it up ahead of this call um, and I couldn't find the name. I wanna say two years ago, a group in Texas launched the politically correct um, ETF. And it was based on, I think data that that Open Secret shares, but the, the corporations that are donating the most to the red party um, got ranked the highest and the highest weights. Um, I do know there's a blue side doing a similar um, thing right now. I would say, um, well, it really depends on what the goals are, right? If, if we're talking about a green party, we certainly can build that. Can it also be inclusive? Um, that's That you have to play a little bit differently. Um, certainly you can track by the donation specifically to candidates as I was, as I was talking about. As far as innovation, each side is going to play out a little bit differently, right? So I was mentioning that with the Trump administration, corporations have so much money, they could be putting a ton of money into innovation right now. Um, whether they are or not um, is really interesting to watch. And in some cases, very sad that they're not using this opportunity to, to build more innovation. One of the things I think about with innovation is access to visas. So whether it's an O1 visa, an EB1, um, you know, and then there's some founders visa and then there's investor visas, um, much more likely that those visas for innovation in the US will happen under a Biden presidency than they are under a Trump presidency. So those, those are things to look at both, you know, we, how does innovation happen? You know, definitely capital. Stella's going to weigh in on how uh, innovation happens today. Um, so we can certainly think about also one of the things we look at at NIA is that innovation happens from diverse teams. And so to the extent that we are having anti-bias training and ability to work across differences and with diverse teams, we're gonna see more innovation and more revenues from companies derived from innovative products and services. And so our politics and who's in charge um, is gonna weigh heavily on, on whether we can build that diverse portfolio. Yeah, and there's an yeah. academic paper from University of North Carolina, North Carolina State, I'm sorry, and, uh, and that shows that diverse teams actually create twice as many patents uh, as non-diverse teams, and that leads to higher revenue growth. Nigel, you wanted to add something? I was going to say it's a it's brought to life in some of the businesses I'm working with right now where there is you know, a team of entrepreneurs based in Australia commercializing IP and developing IP around one of the universities that wants to move the core of their activity commercially to the US. But the whole visa process is somewhat up in the air right now. It seems to have been somewhat normalized. I got my own O visa renewed in late March. So I got in just before everything closed down. Uh, but it is a real issue and for, for that business and for others like it, if they cannot get the visas they need to come and drive the commercialization phase in the US, which they want to do because it's a large market and quite progressive in a, a whole variety of areas, then they will just have to go somewhere else, which will most likely be Europe. Right. And, and that so opportunity Europe, will be lost. That's really interesting too, because I definitely talked to some Conrads in um, in Denmark, where they say, you know, could there be brain drain because the tax system there on individuals is higher, so there's not quite as much incentive, um, you know, so tax structure, um, you know, and then also just the environment and the ethos of is it okay to leave your day job and do a startup? We definitely have capacity and um, and recognition for that in the U.S., whereas in some of the European countries, that's not quite as standard or or as understood as an acceptable path. 
Yeah, I'm absolutely I've, right. I've uh, put the link to the academic paper. Um, and let's, uh, um, and then Lucia Samaras says, uh, when speaking of innovation, diversity needs to be more broad than simply ethnicity, race, or gender. Uh, so I'd be curious, uh, Lucia, share more in the chat box of when you say diversity needs to be more than that. Um, Kurt, you did, um, uh, Kurt, you did a, you've done it doing an, in the process of doing analysis on populism around the world, not only US. Do you want yep. to take a few minutes and whether you have sure. any visuals to show that or talk through the research? And then, talk through the research, yeah. Yeah. And then after that, after we'll do a little mini panel on that, and then we'll come back to the Senate races that uh, Nigel has um, prepared for us. That'd be great. Um, populism has been used a lot over the last couple of years in a variety of contexts, yet the term is not well defined. The company I run, Magni, we measure the quality of uh, country level governance and we've tracked it for almost two decades. Up through 2015, we were seeing a pretty steady but slow increase in governance. So the quality, the average governance of the countries, of the major countries of the world was slowly improving at about 1% a year. Beginning in the latter part of 2015, we saw that slow to less than half the rate. And so we tried to understand what was causing that decrease in improvement in um, governance. And it's the same time when populism became talked about far more frequently, not just here, but around the world. People who don't travel outside the US may not realize that the discussions we have about nationalism and how to interpret it, the discussions we have about um, ethnocentric views of politics, about uh, views on immigration. A lot of the debates we have here are occurring in countries all over the world. So populism tends to have kind of a visceral positive view that, hey, if someone's connected to the population, that must be good, they, they're gonna be a better leader. As we looked at it, we discovered that actually it becomes a tool for not always good purposes. Uh, a populist argument can go along the lines of, look, you need to vote me in because I represent you. Those evil elites have taken advantage of you. They have broken the rules. And you know what? Working within the rules doesn't work. I will break the rules and I will break them for you. And that may resonate with some people. The idea that breaking more rules to fix something doesn't really work that well. It's the old two wrongs don't make a right. So with that, we tried to define what a populist is and that's not easy to do. So we compiled all of the available uh, research and um, broke it into a set of categories. So we look at, does the person consider themselves a populist? Do they tend to blame elites particularly elites um, that are broadly defined. If you go back to some of the truly evil leaders of the past century, they tended to include anyone that had an academic education as elites. Is the language of the leader and their behavior divisive to the population? Do they use a lot of ends justify the means approach to describing what they're doing? I know this is the wrong way to do it, but we need to do blank. Do they tend to dismiss critics and kind of just say they're, they're part of the problem? So any crit criticism isn't a reflection of that it might be a bad idea. It's that they're the enemy because they're criticizing me. And lastly, do they tend to offer simplistic solutions that don't stand up to factual scrutiny? So we defined each of those issues and we're in the middle of building the database. And we've come up with a six point scoring system for each of these six dimensions. And there are some um, interesting insights that are not surprising. So um, people like Bolsonaro in Brazil uh, comes out fairly high on the populism scale. Uh, so does uh, the Australian leader, uh, Nigel. Uh, they both rank a four. Uh, Modi in India ranks a three. So three or higher, we consider a populist. There are people that have no pop populism characteristics. So uh, people like um, Leo Varadkar, who's the head of Ireland, got a zero out of six. 
and there's some others. Um, I was just going to to jump in. There's a really good question here from Charles Masak in in Australia, where he asks, is populism code for democracy, i.e. including all the people, including the so-called deplorables? Now, is you know, thus in conflict with the globalist authoritarian elites? Is that what's driving the polarization of society? How does that play out in how you've looked at that and all this? Well, it's, a, it's a great question. As we've researched the leaders, we have tried to step beyond the headlines and the articles and the political opponents' characterization to take a look at what the person says and what the person does. There is a dynamic around the world about um, a a right-wing version of uh, populism. There's left-wing versions as well. There's a right-wing version about there's a global elite and they don't have our best interests. Um, Trying to be inclusive of all society is a constructive populism. When you start dividing society and saying, this group is special, and that group is bad, is not helpful to society, it's not helpful to governance, it's not constructive to moving forward. So um, I would say when it's used to um, attack global elites, but do so in a divisive way, not just to a small number of people, but to broad chunks of society, that is not a constructive thing to do. The, um, uh, there were some surprises. I expected Xi in China to, to score fairly high as a populist. He got a one out of six. It was, doesn't have much of a populism streak. And surprising to any Canadians that are on the call, Justin Trudeau came out more of a populist than Xi. He got a two out of six. Um, we, we describe him that Magna is in the intermittent populist. As we looked at it, he wasn't consistently a populist on everything, but he occasionally went to his populist toolbox to pull up, pull things out uh, at various times. Um, and for all of you who are wondering, Trump ranks a five and a half out of six. Um, and I'm sorry, Kurt, did you say who was, was anybody a six? No one's a six. So or Trump, historically, are you able to say who was a six? <laughs> pardon me? Histori- is there a historical assessment if you went backwards in time or no? No, no, that's an interesting question. We haven't looked at it. I, um, we'd have to see, you know, you'd have to take a look at some pretty ugly leaders to potentially get a six. Yeah. Again, I'm not trying to equate Trump with the ugly leaders of the past. No, I understand. You know, no, and I put in the chat box, there's an academic paper based on uh, what's called the RWA scale. Yeah. Uh, which is a list of 20 questions, and they're using that with citizens. And the Washington Post also did an article on this um, yesterday, I believe. Um, and so the academic paper is there, and it shows how just you're saying how Trump is overseeing governance that rates a five and a, five and a half out of six towards more authoritarian and less populism. Um, uh, the same thing here in that uh, they did Trump versus Sanders. And so Sanders was not in uh, following those principles and Trump was following those principles. And it's based on individual feelings of people feeling scared and want to be led and being told what to do, uh, which is interesting for a country uh, like the United States or other democracies where generally there's more freedom and more flexibility and less control. Yep. I haven't ranked, my team hasn't ranked Sanders. My guess is Sanders would rank fairly high on populism Mm -hmm. as you look across the categories, perhaps a little lower than Trump, but fairly high. Mm -hmm. Once the database is complete, we're going to um, run the data against our 20 years of history to see if we can pull into the data a correlation, run a regression of the country leaders and their populism score versus the rate of change of governance in the country relative to the rest of the world. If that regression is significant, it means populism does have an impact on governance. If the regression is a negative coefficient and significant, it means that higher population does mean a lower rate of improvement or even deterioration of governance. But we're a little ways away from doing that. You're saying that countries with a billion people like China or India would tilt towards more control? 
Um, no, not necessarily. That's the current system that's in, in place there. Mm -hmm. We rank China's governance as very low. India's governance is a little bit better, but still low. Um, that's populism is correlated with the level of control. Um, on the academic papers, I, I just they're they're good material. I just throw out one caution, which is confirmation bias. A lot of the material in the last four years has been written about pattern recognition for autocrats, hmm. and um, there's there's something called Bayes' theorem. It's about conditional probability, and it explains confirmation bias. That's not the topic here, but let me just kind of simplify the essence down. If you're always asking questions to confirm something, you're not asking questions to test the other side of the issue, you can draw a conclusion. And forgive me, Kristen, this is a data gender example, but if you go back to the 60s, the great way to talk about um, Bayes' theorem was, you see a woman walking down the street and she has glasses. Do you think she's a librarian? It's back before contact lenses. And people would say, yeah, it's the, she's a librarian. Well, the reality is she's probably not a librarian because almost nobody's, very few people are librarians and a significant proportion of women wear glasses, just like a significant proportion of men wear glasses. Mm -hmm. And so it, that's the idea of conditional probability. And so I think it's fairly harmful if we start going down the road of, well, is, you know, um, just because Trump's a narcissist and uh, he's got some other characteristics that doesn't make him an autocrat in the making of some of the evil leaders of the 20th century. So and that, I mean, that prompts, I was going to say that prompts one question, which is, you know, in all of this, and, you know, there are plenty of us who are watching the election here very closely and it's fascinating, but the fundamental challenges that people face, which is loss of jobs to automation, the ongoing robot revolution and all of the pain that has come and will come from that, exacerbated by the health crisis we're now in. And none of these problems have gone away. And if I wind together a couple of the questions which are here, you know, one is a comment, you know, Biden is very unimpressive and the best reason to vote for him seems to be he is not Trump. Uh, and there's a little bit more to the question than that. And, but he stood and he ran on the basis that he was dealing or trying to deal with or claiming to deal with, depending on where you are on the spectrum, the problems of the ordinary person who has been roundly overlooked for a really long time. And add to that, and this is a, another question from Charles in, in Australia, you know, why have right-wing leaders in the US, UK and Australia surprisingly won elections on the back of workers who traditionally voted solidly for parties of the left, as in the last UK election, where the Tories did particularly well in the north of England in areas that had just not been their heartland at all. And I'm fascinated in the views around that, because this is the big, you know, this is the kind of the really big problem we face, which is how to deal with the things that actually are impacting people. The, if I can jump in here, the three examples are countries that have historically been white leadership, if you look around the world, there are variations on that. Duterte in the Philippines, Bolsonaro in Brazil, um, the fellow in Indonesia, Malaysia, Modi in India. You have similar patterns. The skin colors are different, but you have um, leaders appealing to a rural working class. Um, Duda in Poland is the same way that feel that they've been excluded, whether or not the leader has actually done something for them or not is less of an issue. The people are reaching out to people who have felt excluded, whether or not they have been excluded. And it's a global phenomenon. It's part of the populism swing. It's part of why my company has been doing the research it's doing because it's a fairly interesting phenomenon. So um, let's, Chris, I have a question for you on uh, uh, how this applies to different countries of that your portfolio, you have portfolios of companies in different countries that increase access to healthcare and the like. How do you see those risks uh, for country or companies operating in those countries? Um, and then after we do that, we'll, we'll get back to the Senate, um, Senate view. Sure. So um, it's definitely affects how we do our due diligence and how we look at risks. So 
when, you know, just across Europe in general, um, one, you know, even starting from the top, many of those um, countries have caps and limits and quotas on executive management and or um, board diversity. Um, so it makes our job a little bit easier because they're already forward thinking in how they're going to fill for diverse positions. And of course, healthcare is not an issue that they worry about. So it's less of a stress, both for employees, um, for jobs, for HR teams, um, because it's part and parcel of what they do. Um, you know, whether you like the healthcare over there, everyone gets it, you know, so, so um, generally people are happier in some of these um, countries. And I think largely it has to do with their basic needs being met um, at a government level. So, so certainly it has to do with that. Um, of course, we saw in, in the U.S. that, um, you know, wh why we were coupling um, healthcare with full-time employment, you know, was, you know, obviously it's an is issue of our times and how we're going to deal with it. May the, the, whoever wins in November, may they take this on and may they make this make sense for our economy and for the companies we invest in, right? Um, so I spoke briefly about, you know, this new nominee for the Supreme Court may or may not have a lot to do with women's health care. And, you know, of course, in Europe, that's not something we need to think about for companies that are domiciled there and who have a large presence there, or also around the world in other ways. So we, it's certainly something we think about, and we definitely see some of the U.S. practices as causing some risks. Yeah, and for those of you who missed uh, the last Green Jobs Report, um, uh, one of our last ESGX episodes, Dr. Carolyn uh, McClanahan talked about different um, models to fund healthcare or different alternatives to Medicare for all. So go to ESGX.org uh, to see that episode. All right, Nigel, let's, uh, so Kurt, thanks for the research on populism. We look forward to the results uh, coming out and whether populism aligns with democracy is what people yeah. want, actually democratic or authoritarian. Uh, that's something that keeps me up at night and uh, how it might align or not with uh, economic performance. Uh, all right, uh, Nigel, you've done a lot of research for our episode today. What are we looking at now? Yeah, so let's talk about this and then jump into the Senate, if you can jump into the Senate. So this just lays out again those same marginal states when it comes to the presidential race and their current polling, and then shows what is unemployment state by state, because the variations are huge from, you know, roughly 4% at the bottom end here, Nebraska, one of the, the lowest unemployment states up to Nevada, which is in the, you know, almost in the low teens and New York, not on this list, because it's, it's far from a marginal state, but has also had very high unemployment. So you can imagine that that may be a factor which weighs on people's minds and is creating uncertainty. And there is, broadly speaking, more unemployment at the top of the chart there in the states that are more solidly in, leaning towards the Democrats. On the healthcare point around COVID, you don't see the same thing here really at all. The cases, are, <clears throat> there's not much difference in case numbers across the states. The numbers vary widely, but nothing you can really pick between Democrat and Republican. And those figures will be skewed by more aggressive testing in some places. But if you look at the outcomes from a health point of view, then the states with Republican governors, as we flagged over on the right, deaths per million of population 50 percent higher than in states with democrat governors again there's an awful lot of work will get done on cause and effect over time but it will be interesting to see how these things weigh on people's minds as they come to vote and i'm sure there'll be a lot of academic papers written about that so those average jump in bottom show democratic governor states <laughs> higher unemployment but fewer deaths yeah, exactly. And these are just linear. This is not weighted averages. This is just the linear thing across those states. So it's pretty simple, but it does show, you know, there's really, really massive variations. Uh, and you can, you know, if you follow the history, the figures here for Arizona don't look too bad because Arizona went through a huge spike in cases at one point in time, you know, and that seemed to link a little bit with the trajectory of the voting support for the Democrats in Arizona, which is, and that state's been shifting blue over a series of of electoral cycles. So if we then just jump into the, the Senate, uh, uh, currently 
Sorry, it says 5743. That's a terrible typo. Of course, it should say 4753, but it's 53 in favor of the Republicans. Currently, the real clear politics map suggests that at this election where a third of the 100 seats are up for grabs because the, the voting is every six years effectively in the Senate in the US, so a third every two years, uh, will those seven will uh, you know, are the ones where it will play out. And the forecast currently, if I just pull up my map again of where these are, you have four where the polling shown over on the right there is solidly for the Democrat candidates. And those four shift the Democrats from 47 to 51. And of course, the Republicans from 53 to 49. There are two down the bottom, which are reasonably solidly uh, uh, leaning to the Republicans, which is David Perdue in Georgia and Steve Daines in Montana. The fascinating race here, of course, is Lindsey Graham and Jamie Harrison in South Carolina. It's just absolutely line ball. And of course, this is a state that is, or a seat that was very solidly Republican. And Lindsey Graham, I, I suspect Kurt will know how long he's been in that role, but it's, it's not a short period of time. Long time. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, uh, 18 years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the other one is uh, Sarah Co Susan Collins uh, attacking the main speaker of the house, Sarah Gideon, uh, for not being a main, a mainer is what they say, you know, Michigan, yeah. Manders and Maine, it's mainers. And um, she's been there for 15 years, but she's being attacked of being liked by too many people. And she's <laughs> also being attacked of being sort of a luxury, luxury liberal. Uh, Susan Collins, and it's about where you live in Maine, where you live in Bangor, Maine, or elsewhere in Maine. So, and Susan Collins is finally going negative in the past three weeks. Yeah. Another October surprise is Susan Collins, yeah. um, instead of walking a tightrope, going Yeah, up. from from plus 37 at the last, uh, when this seat was, when, was up for a contest in 2014. So that's a really huge, huge swing, must be one of the biggest swings across the entire electoral map, I would guess. And then one other thing um, uh, this can happen with either candidate. In this case, it happened with the Democratic candidate in North Carolina. Cal Cunningham uh, was uh, sexting, texting uh, sexual messages uh, while being married to somebody, one of people on his staff. Um, that appears to be blowing over. So, um, uh, so uh, it compressed, but now it's expanding again. So, uh, you know, politics always always a surprise so and of course the senate incredibly important because it drives the appointment of supreme court justices and it also drives the appointment of the you know people into the the administration itself so having control of the senate makes a massive difference in being able to get your administration up and running smoothly and effectively should you choose to use that of course which is not always the case the you know, many roles in the current were, not, were simply not filled in the current administration and then I think most of us know this, but just to repeat, should the Senate turn out 50-50, then it very much depends on the president because the, uh, the presidential vice presidential election, because the president of the Senate is the vice president of the United States. So should there be 50-50, uh, um, <clears throat> the vice president casts the deciding vote when there's a tie. So very important um, election. Um, Kristen, Kurt, observations on Senate races and, and states? Really good summary. Um, mm -hmm. If I could do, a, do another digression on polling, there's been a lot of discussion given uh, some of the issues that were identified with the 2016 polls. Uh, there was a set of articles that came out today, uh, including Nate Silver over at 538, talking about whether or not pollsters have changed. And um, he is seeing preliminary data that says pollsters have changed and maybe overreacted from the experience of 2016. So whereas 16 somewhat underreported the depth of support for uh, Republicans and hence uh, part of the reason why it was a surprise that Trump won, the reverse may be true that Trump and the Republicans may actually have less support than is in the polling, given some of the tuning that was done by the polling firms. We will see. 
We will see. That's actually could be a good uh, bridge. Um, Kristen, other observations around the Senate? Otherwise, I think we're going to move to voter participation. No, I mean, the Senate is fascinating. Um, I was upset with Cal Cunningham, I have to say. Um, you know that we know what the rules are of the game. We know that in different countries, particularly in Europe, they play them differently. We know um, how, how they're played here. And we expect someone married to not be sexting. And that's just the way the American public is. And so for those Democrats and others that supported his campaign and continue to support his campaign, um, the sexting has to wait until after you're elected. And then it seems like we have a higher tolerance for that. And I just, I wanna put it out there, the women and people of color can't afford, those candidates don't ever even think about sexting during their campaign. And I'm just calling it out, you know, may he win and may, um, you know, but that's an issue that Americans don't tolerate and we cannot tolerate that from our candidates until we change the rules. I said it. Okay. Oh, it's very welcome. Yep, it's, it, <laughs> Nothing it's, more it's to terrible say. that it's like that, but it is entirely true. And we have this playing out in the state of New South Wales right now, where the Premier of New South Wales is caught up in an investigation by the Independent Commission Against Corruption in the state. And I won't go into the details here, but again, you know, there are other male leaders who have been caught up in such things and some of whom have managed to brush them aside. There was another leader that got caught up in having a very expensive bottle of wine given to him, which he didn't manage to brush aside and was forced to resign. So we'll see how that plays out. But it's, it's, an, it's an ugly thing. If you're in those roles, then you know, it, it's, a, it's pretty unforgiving. The court so of Nigel, public opinion. in the last US presidential election, it wasn't won by Hillary Clinton and it wasn't won by Donald Trump. <laughs> Who won That's right. Election? Everybody, a lot of people like to say that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but of course that is not true. The popular vote was done, won by a, a very popular candidate that wins almost all US elections, which was did not vote, did not vote, scored almost as much support as Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump combined. And it's worth everybody remembering this when you think, does your vote matter? Every vote matters. And if you're in the majority of not doing anything about the choice of political representatives at president, in the Senate, in the House, in your state elections and everywhere else, that's a very dangerous game. I came across an example recently of someone, and this was in a very small scale thing where someone had realized they could just run an election and not really tell anybody out about it and magically win, which they did. And everybody was outraged, but no one had gone to vote. So what do you expect to happen? Mm -hmm. So this is a very real thing, very important. And the other point in here, of course, is that those candidates in the middle, the Libertarian, Green, others, add up to about the difference between the two, in fact, slightly more than the difference between the two candidates, if I remember the numbers rightly. So those votes cast in the middle need to be cast, you know, if you're saying, I want to make the point that there should be other candidates and that's more important than who becomes president, then I respect that position. But if, you, if you're trying to change the dial somehow, otherwise, it's a dangerous game. And some of the famous non-voters uh, have included Meg Ryan, uh, sorry, Meg Whitman. <laughs> Whitman, yeah. Meg Whitman of eBay when she ran for governor, um, that was called out. Carly Fiorina, famous non-voter. More recently, Shaquille O'Neal has admitted that he had not voted. This is the first presidential election. So this isn't just uh, rural or low income. This is people of all uh, backgrounds and conditions, that for various reasons. So this process now of voting um, uh, more effectively by mail and figuring out the mechanics of it um, and figuring out the standardization of it is very important. And, um, and that's why it, it becomes not only a rally your base, but it's who can you get who hasn't voted to vote. <laughs> um, and how do you up voter information to make that a productive vote? Kurt? Uh, if, if I there's a yet another reason to vote this time, in addition to a significant presidential election. This is the year that legislators are chosen, particularly at the state level, and we're gonna go through redistricting with this slate of legislators that will be elected yeah. next month. And that has, that'll last for the next decade. <clears throat> right, and the past, um, the recent focus on Immigrants and immigrants um, who may not yet be citizens are may actually be uh, undercounted in the latest census. And the breaking news while we've been having this webinar is 
the Supreme Court with only Sotomayor dissenting has said, okay, census over, we don't need to make sure and count everybody. So this is just, in my view, gonna contribute to erosion of trust in any institutions, trying to promote diversity, inclusivity, citizen, you know, uh, representation. Um, Kristen, thoughts on uh, getting voter participation up? I know you're very active in this. You know, I'm really active and it's not a heavy lift, particularly in the US where we can have ballots mailed to us. And yet, if you're not feeling empowered and enfranchised, um, you know, the message before that you both have said is does your, does your, um, ballot count. And I think there's many of us in the US that are just not feeling that it does. Um, and what can we do to um, shift that view such that it makes sense? Um, another piece of just building this into who we are as a culture that's really been missing since um, the high stakes testing came in, you know, several decades ago is civics. And, you know, what does it mean to be a citizen of the United States is not taking that vote for granted. And yet our educational systems aren't doing that. And so, you know, the first field trip we really need to have probably second, third grade, once we're back post COVID times and are having field trips again is, you know, to the ballot box and, you know, homework, um, you know, either bringing a, one of the fake ballot boxes to the high school classroom, you know, or marching everybody to the real ballot box um, and having ballots um, and particularly the down tickets. I mean, the down ticket items, you know, our judges um, are, you know, some of the most important election items. And yet many of us don't feel comfortable. We don't know the names. We don't know who they are. And we don't honestly know what that position does. You know, we don't know how much power that position has in our own local communities. And so until we can connect the dots with our educational system, as well as our investment system and our economy and how we can see how each of these different um, levels, particularly, um, parties even, you know, but particularly candidates, I think once we can share that information widely in a public forum, such as a high school classroom, um, we're at a loss. So we have at least three questions. Um, Kurt, I think you're going to take this first one from Francesca Redeker, um, addressing the effects of increased voter suppression and intimidation. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we have some other questions to cover too. Go That's for another super important one. It's not just people that aren't voting, it's people that are actually trying to vote that are having issues. So that, let somebody deal with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I might jump in first on this just as someone who's a foreigner and who can't vote. The extent of gerrymandering of boundaries in the US of significant efforts to make it incredibly hard for people to vote. If you're in the wrong state and you want to vote a certain way, you may get one ballot box between a million people. Uh, and in other parts of the state, you've got a ballot box more or less at the end of your road. It is just extraordinary. And if this happened in other countries, we would all laugh at it and say they desperately need someone else running their elections. In the US, as, as probably most people know, there is an ele a federal election commission. Uh, it has six commissioners. You need four people for it to be quorate. Currently, only three seats are filled, so there is no supervision. And that is, uh, for America to think it's a great democracy, well, it's, it's just not running like a great democracy at all. Now, I say that as a, a foreigner who doesn't entirely understand the system here, but it's shocking. Yeah, I, to me, I find some of the discussions absolutely crazy because we have a big discussion going on on voter fraud. And yes, I know there's some degree of voter fraud, but it's far less than we're spending time talking about in the media yet the voter suppression is real. Uh, Nigel, I believe you're referring to Texas with some of the crazy ballot box uh, rules which are out there. Um, I was having a discussion earlier today with some historically Republican friends who are no longer associating with the Republican Party given the current environment. And we were talking about some of the things that Republicans have pushed for that they have felt are good governance, good voting, and they were pushing me on them. For example, things like voter ID. And my pushback to them was, what happens is there are some Rep Republicans who really want this as a good voting thing, but also there are other Republicans that want this as a voter suppression thing. 
And kind of one way to ferret it out is to say, okay, I'll tell you what, we'll do voter ID, but as part of this, we need a massive program to make sure that everyone in this country has an ID. That means you have to go to nursing homes, you have to go to inner cities, you have to go to rural areas to make sure that everyone has an ID. You also need to make sure that you have easy way to get to the ballot box, either a, um, a mail-in system or easy transportation, because there's a lot of obstacles to voting. And the whole, the whole intimidation thing, we could have a whole session on that because there are so many components to that. And I see someone yeah. uh, posted something about poll tax. You know, that's our history. That's an ugly part of our history that was there. We've got other techniques that are bad. If I could just finish with one plug, one of the things we need to do in this country is we need to fix the voter registration databases. To the credit, the West Coast has done that. California, Washington, and Oregon have three of the best in the country. It, it, the rest of the country doesn't look that good. And part of our problems is we've got a crappy system. And I'm not talking about it in the Georgia style where we're trying to purge a bunch of voters from it. Just clean it up use modern technology, make it easy to track when people move, make it easy for people to adjust to wherever they live now. We haven't done that in most of the country and that creates a whole set of problems off of it. All right, we are a few minutes over, so we're gonna try and target to close within uh, five to 10 minutes. Um, there's a question here about third party candidates or when do other parties start to have a presence? I would say the Tea Party has been one of those that's made some progress with some congressional representatives. Apparently there might be a QAnon party emerging, uh, at least for one representative in Congress. So um, are there ways for this to happen faster? Uh, would two parties break up into sub parties and we have four parties maybe, a moderate and extreme ring of, of each of the two parties, is that possible? I personally think it's unlikely we don't have a parliamentary system. And outside of a parliamentary system where it's easy for smaller parties to get shares and to create coalitions, our system tends to have two amoeba-like parties that sit somewhat to the left and right of each other respectively. And they tend to only respond when their power structure is threatened. And so the primary role of third parties tends to be to attack the power structure to cause them to change in a direction, whether it's something inside the party like the Tea Party or something like the Green Party or the Libertarian Party that is a formal political party or the Independence Party. Yeah, Ross Perot polled as high as 40% till he imploded, but he, <laughs> yes. still, but he still pulled 19% of the vote the first time around. Very much so. And we still debate what would have happened had he not existed and would uh, Bush have been reelected, the elder Bush. Um, all right, one other question. Uh, there's a question about in, in, of inclusivity versus diversity. Um, is there anything next level we want to say around that? This is probably a whole ESGX on its own. It's a good commercial for next week's ESGX. Uh, on uh, rights, uh, especially in the LGBTQ community. Um, but is there anything we wanna say with regard to diversity and inclusion and equity in voting uh, for this conversation? Boy, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wave the, the American flag on this. We are an imperfect union in pursuit of some amazing ideals and we've fallen short with many communities. Going forward, we should have a country and a government that continues us on that path. We've made some progress. What we've done uh, with uh, the whole gay marriage issue is part of that. We've made progress on civil rights, but we have a tremendous way still to go. And part of a decision-making process about who you're gonna vote for is which candidate will do a better job of continuing us on this path to our ever more perfect union. Kristen? Well, I think um, 
Oh my gosh, so much has been said in the last hour. I, I definitely just addressing, um, you know, we need a diverse group at the table and we also need every voice heard. So that speaks to the inclusion and can we build inclusive practices that then bring the diversity in, in the ways that, and I think we had some um, posts about that, about, you know, what does it mean to have diversity there? And of course it absolutely means there needs to be inclusion and who's making the decisions, both at the voting box, um, who gets to even run? I mean, we didn't really talk about who gets to be a candidate. That's a form of inclusion that, that we could be addressing as well. Um, and then of course, encouraging everyone to vote with their dollars um, and to increase those dollars so there's more inclusion there. Great, Nigel, you want to uh, uh, help us start to summarize and so we'll bring this to a close in a few minutes. Sure, Paul, very happy to do that. So maybe just a, a quick reminder, you know, where we are in the, the house race, which is that it's, it looks like it's leaning solidly towards the, sorry, this is in the Electoral College. It looks reasonably solid for Biden at this point. It's very different from the situation from 2012, uh, particularly if you listen to the man from 538 saying, maybe people have over adapted their polling, but nevertheless, you know, every vote is gonna to continue to count. Uh, we've talked about the Senate. It looks like it's heading towards 4951, but we are watching in particular that that one race that is absolutely line ball and could deliver an extra, really extraordinary result. The other thing, of course, is just what happens now. So, of course, we all know Election Day is the 3rd of November, but unlike most years, this may be a little bit more the beginning of a chapter than the end of a chapter. The votes essentially have to be counted by the 8th of December. The electors that are that appointed to the Electoral College cast their votes in their state capitals on the 14th of December. And if this sounds curious, this is just the way it plays out. And there may be all sorts of wrinkles as this runs forward. And then, of course, the votes themselves are formally counted on the 6th of January uh, when we will, for those of us that have Christmas trees, will be taking out our Christmas trees uh, in a joint setting of the House. And then the mo last and perhaps most important point where there's lots of misinformation, the 20th of January is the date of inauguration, but it's also the date on which current terms expire. So if everything was left up in the air and there was not a clear result, Trump would cease to be president on that day. So would the vice president and the discussion will be around who's next in line. Uh, and there's a simple answer to that, but there's also a more complicated litigated answer to that. And clearly everybody hopes that we don't get there and that the result we see in a, a three weeks time is much more black and white than, than might, that would, would ca cause all the kind of chaos that we're hoping to avoid. And in the year 2000, the Supreme Court decided it at the beginning of December, five to four. So it came down to Supreme Court representation. Yeah. Great. Exactly right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nigel, for all your deep research and preparation. Thank you, uh, Kristen Hall of NIA Impact Capital for all your leadership and deep, wise insights. Thank you, Kurt Lieberman of Magni Global and uh, your research on populism as well as country governance. Um, so please check out um, their websites to learn more. And uh, they are recurring guests on ESGX. Um, next week, uh, Rick uh, Mordesevic of uh, Sonoma Private Wealth and Doug Heskey of New Day Investing have, are bringing us uh, Equal Forever After, the unfinished work of LGBTQ rights. And, um, and so we have um, leaders and innovators in the community. So definitely please join us and um, uh, share the invitation with your friends. Uh, the week after, the week before election day, we have the Green Jobs Report and we have very special, amazing guest. Um, Sarah Nelson is the head of the airline uh, employees uh, union. Uh, some have talked about her as a potential uh, next president of the AFL-CIO. So she'll join us on the Green Jobs Report to talk about airlines, hospitality, and travel. You may have seen her on 60 Minutes, amazing um, leader. Um, so she'll be on ESGX. And then um, uh, all of us are going to be out uh, helping the voting be successful on election day. And so the week after election day, um, uh, we've organized uh, a mix of panelists 
for a post-election um, post election day <laughs> synthesis, hopefully uh, with election results, and a countdown to 2021. What's, you know, what should we be thinking about? And then in December, uh, we're preparing a large e-conference on ESGX. And of course, Green Santa will make an appearance during uh, the holidays. So thanks for joining today. Please remember this is free online and global. This is meant to inform and educate and spur everybody to more action. Feel free to uh, hit the like button and the share button on your social media. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next time on ESGX. So thank you, Nigel Lake in New York, Nick Gower in the production room, uh, Kristen and Kurt for joining us. I'm Paul Herman based in San Francisco. We'll see you next time on ESGX.org.